If you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out with me. This morning, we're going to continue back into our series uh, that I've entitled The Big Idea. And we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke today. Luke 15 is where I'm going to be at in just a few moments. But in this particular series, what I'm doing, as the Lord enables us, is just highlighting what is the main theme of the four Gospels, the first four books there in the New Testament. And also, we're going to look into the book of Acts. And so, if you've missed any of these, you can always go back online to our church website. There are our videos of our, our past uh, messages. But as just a quick summary, when we looked into the Gospel of Matthew, the, the major emphasis of the Gospel of Matthew was the Messiahship of Jesus Christ, the one that they had been dreaming of, the one they'd been talking about, the one that they had been prophesied about, finally shows up. After hundreds, if not thousands of years of prophetic messages. Then we jump into the gospel of, of Mark that we looked at a couple weeks ago. And the main emphasis in the gospel of Mark is the servanthood of Jesus Christ. And in all of these, we're looking into to something about the person of Jesus Christ, the individual of Jesus Christ. So we, we discovered how, how Jesus in the gospel of Mark was the greatest servant of all. And today we're looking into the Gospel of Luke. And what I, I want you to capture in the Gospel of Luke is what has been referred to as the humanity of Jesus Christ. And if you don't capture anything else this morning, please capture this. When we reflect on the humanity of Jesus Christ, is that we have a God who cares about us. A God who cares about us. And I would go as far as to say this, understands our experiences of life. And so Luke himself is the writer of this particular book, the Gospel of Luke. We also realize he wrote the book of of Acts. And we realize later in Scripture that Luke is a physician who evidently committed his life to alleviating human suffering. And so I think it's by no accident, really just the inspiration of God into his life, that he stresses to us the humanity of Jesus. He's concerned that suffering humanity, no, we have a God who cares, and once again, I I would say understands each one of our life. His name doesn't appear in this book, as I said, or in the book of Acts, but we do find three other places that the name Luke appears in the New Testament. Let let me give these to you because I think that they're important. Beginning in Colossians chapter 4, where we find Luke, and he's, he's referred to as the beloved physician. Then in Philemon, where he is called Paul's fellow worker, and then in 2 Timothy 4, where he stands by Paul during these dark hours of his life, just before the martyrdom of Paul himself. In all three of these passages, Luke's life bears evidence that he had come to know in Christ a God who cares and understands. Not just him, but a God who cares about us, a God who understands us, regardless of who we are, where we live, what we've done in our life. Once again, Luke's message is that in Jesus, we have a God who cares. And we find 24 chapters in the Gospel of Luke, and I want to summarize it down into three statements for you when we look into the main emphasis, the humanity of of God himself. Number one, God understands what it is to be human, for he was human. God understands what it is to be human, for he was human. I want you to look at a couple passages with me. First, Luke chapter 15. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. Verse 2, But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. That's what I want you to capture. That God is willing to sit down with sinners. 
And I don't know about you, but I'm glad. Because I know I have sinned. And I'm glad that that didn't disqualify me. That realized that God cares about me. And is willing to, to sit with me. To eat with me. Just as we find many times over Jesus doing this throughout his life, his ministry, while, while human, while here on, on earth fellowshipping with, with, with individuals. Luke chapter 1, verse 31 says, the, 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 the old Christmas, Christmas story says, You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Once again, God understands what it is to be human, for he was human. Apart from being conceived by the Holy Spirit, Christ's birth was as human as my birth. We would say it was as human as your birth. He was conceived in the womb of a woman, as any else of us have been. And the physical aspects of his, of his birth were identical to anybody else's birth. Even his life was, his, his, he had a natural birth. We would say he had a natural growth. He had a natural development of life. I think so often in our minds, when we think of Jesus, we think he came down as a full-grown man, down on the clouds, and all of a sudden, poof, he was here on earth. But that's not how Jesus came. He came and it was born just like each one of us was born. He lived like each one of us lived. He, he developed like each one of us developed. God, God understands through the person of Jesus what it's like to be human because he was human. The title Son of Man is used in Luke's account 23 times, once again, to stress the humanity of Jesus. It's often thought to be Christ's favorite designation for himself, but whatever else this title may mean, it means that Christ was human as the Son of Man. Let me just give you a few of these. Luke 9, 58, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Luke 5, 24, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Luke 7, 34, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. Luke 6, 5, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Luke 9, 44, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Luke 12, 40, the Son of Man will come at an hour that you do not expect him. These plus 17 other such references to the Son of Man assures us that our God is a God who cares and a God who understands. Why? Because our God was human. Now I want to give you five, five thoughts in regards to this. Number one, his temptations were human. When he said to his disciples on the night he was to be betrayed. Luke 22, pray that you will not fall into temptations. Can we understand that Jesus knew what he was talking about? He lived a life of temptation. Sometimes we, we miss this. But even very early on, Luke 4, there in the wilderness, the account where Satan himself comes and tempts Jesus over and over and over again, experiencing these temptations. And may we realize today that the temptations of his life never let up. They chased him until his very last breath on the cross. Why? Because Jesus' temptations and battles are as real, were as real as the temptations and battles that you and I face in today's world. This is why we can go to Christ unashamed of our temptations. Hebrews 4.15 assures us that this high priest, referring to Jesus of ours, understands our weaknesses since he had the same temptations we do, though he never once gave way to them nor sent. Hebrews 4.15. Jesus' understanding when I say that we have a God who cares and understands, his understanding does not mean that he condones our giving in to the temptations. He simply understands what it is to be human, and he understands what it is to face temptations of life. But because he understands, he doesn't condone our wrongdoings. 
I've often heard this in church when people try to describe something that they're going to do that they know that they shouldn't do. They'll say, I'm glad God understands. Now, that's a misunderstanding is what that is. God doesn't understand us choosing to do wrong, but he does offer forgiveness if we choose to do wrong. He just understands what it is to be human and what it is to face the various temptations of life because he was human just like us. Number two, his compassion was human. Turn with me to Luke chapter 7. Luke 7. Let's read this together. Luke 7, picking up in the 11th verse. It says, soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave them back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. What what do I want you to capture as we look into this this passage today? Because he was human, he demonstrated compassion. I believe that there's no stronger word than compassion when we think of pity or sympathy or feeling. It's a word that is used again and again in the Gospels to describe this beautiful characteristic of Jesus himself. The Stoics, if you do any study of religious history, the Stoics held that the primary characteristics of God was apathy, or we would say the inability of feeling, the inability to feel. Yet in Luke... We're presented with this amazing conception of who was the Son of God, yet he was human enough to be moved with compassion. So because he was human, he faced temptations like us. He had human compassion. Thirdly, think of it this way, his disappointments were human. Some would question Did Jesus ever get disappointed? Well, he was human. I think Scripture would even reveal some of these disappointments. Jesus was disappointed in his own hometown. Luke 4, 24, he makes the statement, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Revealing some of his disappointments that he would have had. There's another one. He was disappointed in those that he heals. Luke 17, verse 17, he says, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the other nine? You know the story is he heals the ten, and only one comes back to Jesus to offer thanks for the healing. And then Jesus immediately responds, Well, where, where are the other nine? In essence, why didn't they come back to offer thanks? Here's another one. Maybe he was disappointed in the one of the ones he had chosen. Luke 22, he states, Behold, the hand of him that betrays me is with me on the table. One of the 12 disciples that he called. I mean, let's just think of it from a human perspective. Anybody ever been betrayed before? Is it not a little disappointing? And he was human just like us. He had to have a lot of these same feelings that we have. So... His temptations were human. His compassion was human. His disappointments were human. Let me give you just two more. His prayer life was human. His prayer life. Luke 5, 16, and he withdrew himself into the wilderness to pray. Luke 22, 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as if great drops of blood falling to the ground. You know, when I I read this, nowhere do I have the thought that Jesus is somehow trying to stage his prayers. 
He realized he needed fellowship with God. He needed that intimacy with his Father God. He prayed because simply he needed to pray. He, was, he had human temptations. He had human trials. He had human sufferings. Because of so, he needed to pray just like you and I need prayer. If Jesus needed to pray, surely we need to pray. Leads me to my fifth thought. I already gave it to you. His suffering was human. His suffering. Think of it like this. When the whip lashed across Jesus' back, tearing its flesh, it hurt him just like it would have hurt us. Because he was human. When the nails were driven into his hands and his feet, it hurt him just like it would have hurt you because he was human. When the spear was thrust into his side and out poured blood and then water, it happened because he was human. He suffered just as if you and I would suffer. His cry for thirst during his time of suffering just like us when we're thirsty. Why? Because he was human. You see, because God was human, he cares. And he understands. I believe what Luke is saying as we reflect on the humanity of Jesus Christ is when it gets difficult, when the temptations are great, when the suffering is great, when the agony is real, don't give up. Don't give up on life. There's somebody who cares, and his name is Jesus Christ. It's God who became man, the humanity of Jesus. He understands what it is to be human, and he endured to the end, and he can help each one of us to endure to the end also. Number two, my second summary statement for you, God understands the difficulty of forgiveness, for he forgave and yet still forgives. If you're there in Luke 7, turn over just a few verses. I'm going to pick up in verse 41, but this is the story where this lady comes to anoint Jesus. And Simon gets a little upset because Jesus is allowing this lady to, in essence, to weep, to cry on him, to wipe his feet with their tears. Simon was, Simon was having a, a difficult time forgiving the woman who cleansed Jesus' feet with her tears. Read, read along with me. Luke 7, let's just pick up in the middle of this. Verse 41, two men, this is Jesus talking, two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Then one of them, neither one of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Verse 43, Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, said Jesus. Verse 44, then he turned toward the woman, and then he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Think of this for a moment, church. This lady's sin was known everywhere. And they began to wonder, how could Jesus 
begin to forgive this lady. This lady was notoriously bad. She, she was the town prostitute, who this lady was. But evidently, she had heard of Jesus. Somewhere in her past, she probably had heard Jesus speak. And around her neck, like all Jewish women, she wore a small vial of concentrated perfume. These vials were called alabasters, and they were believed to be very, very costly. Evidently, she wanted to pour it on Jesus' feet, for it was all that she had to offer to Jesus. But as she saw Jesus' compassion for her, tears began to well up in her eyes. Roll down her cheek, drop off her cheek, and hit the feet of Jesus. Probably wondering, what do I do with the tear, tears that are falling on Jesus' feet? She unties, unbraids her hair, and begins to wipe her tears off the feet of Jesus. Barclay reminds us that for a Jewish woman to appear with her hair down was an act of the gravest immodesty. On her wedding day, a girl bound her hair and never would she appear with it again unbound in public. The fact that this woman loosed her hair her long hair in this public setting showed that she had forgotten all others and was only concerned with Jesus Christ. Giving Jesus her complete attention, giving Jesus, in essence, her complete affection. Could I, could I remind you this morning, church, that, that Jesus is worthy of our attention, that Jesus is worthy of all the affection that we could bestow upon Jesus, not worrying about who's around us. This, this lady wasn't concerned about who was around her. She just wanted to pour all of her affection on Jesus. Why? Because Jesus demonstrated compassion into her life. This whole story, I believe, reveals a contrast between two attitudes of the mind and the heart. Simon, in regards to this lady, was aware of no need, obviously felt no love for her. Because of so, he offered this lady no forgiveness. Jesus, on the other hand, we recognize hates sin, but loves the sinner. And I'm so thankful for that. To him, there was no problem in forgiving a repentant sinner, such as this lady. We recognize in the story, out of his compassion and his love for her, he offers this lady forgiveness. But I also want you to realize with me this morning, church, we're talking about a God who understands the difficulty of forgiveness because he forgave, not only forgave those who asked for forgiveness and were repentant, Jesus also forgave those who were not repentant. Some would say, are you sure? Yes. Think of it this way, for those who nailed him to the cross and hurled insults at them, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if he be the Christ. While he's dying on the cross, they're hurling insults, persecuting him, inflicting harm on his life. He cries out. We say he prays to God, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. They haven't asked for forgiveness. They haven't even begun to repent. And Jesus cries out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. I don't know about you. This couldn't have been easy. 
that Jesus willingly did it. He understands the difficulty of forgiveness, yet he forgives. Over and over and over. When we, like Simon Peter, we might would ask, but Lord, how many times do I got to forgive them? And think of it this way. Peter throws out a pretty extreme number in their traditional mindset. He says, up to seven times. And Jesus says, oh, no, 70 times seven. And as it's, you just keep forgiving as much as necessary. Just forgive and forgive, forgive and forgive. Remember the words of Christ, underscored again by the prayer on the cross. I tell you, not 70 times, but 77 times. Even, even if they ask for forgiveness or don't ask for forgiveness, even if they repent or don't repent, Jesus says, just forgive. He's hanging on the cross dying, and he cries out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's not as if they've come and asked for forgiveness. It's taken it a whole different level. It doesn't even matter if I feel like forgiving them. God says, just forgive. Just forgive. It's not always easy. But just forgive. Let me give you the third one this morning. God understands the need of assurance, or I might would say strength, for he was assured. You know, early on in Jesus' life, It was the Sabbath, and Jesus sees this man with a shriveled hand, and because he loves, he healed this man, and you would think that people would be happy that he healed this guy, but because it was the Sabbath, they weren't happy at all. Luke 6, verse 11 says, they were filled with madness. And commune one with another what they might do to Jesus. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto his to him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom he then named apostles. No, so here early in his ministry. He sees the man with the shriveled hand once again. Sabbath day, he reaches out, touches him, and provides healing. The people aren't excited at all. They start combating him, making threats against him, saying demeaning hurtful things. And let's not forget Jesus is human. Is it not disturbing when you do something good and then people make threats say mean things about you this is early on and what does Jesus do because he's human he goes away to pray probably just needing assurance because this, this is a concept that sometimes is hard for us to capture. We see Jesus as God, divine, which he was. But we also believe he was fully human. And I just have to believe he needed some strengthening. He needed some assurance. You know, let, let, let me liken it to this. Maybe you've recently accepted Jesus into your life and you're all excited about Jesus. Or maybe you just kind of went through some difficult seasons and Jesus miraculously touched you, and you're, you're excited about telling people what Jesus has done. And you go out, and you begin to serve and to do things, and all of a sudden people say, well, you're not doing it right. You're not quoting the right scriptures. You're not doing the right thing. And you're thinking, what? Because let's be honest, religious people are good at doing stuff like that. They, 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 they didn't just do it when Jesus was around. They still do it today. 
Well, you're not, you're not standing right. You're not dressed right. You're not singing right. The list goes on and on of the things you're not doing right. And all you're trying to do is just testify about Jesus. All you're trying to do is just worship Jesus. All you're trying to do is just love Jesus. But the religious people are telling you, you're not doing it right. And then they'll start saying a bunch of crazy things about you. This is exactly what happened to Jesus. He just had to get away with the Father. Probably just being reassured of what his mission, what his purpose and plan was. And, and, and catch this, he didn't just get away for about five or ten minutes. Scripture says in Luke, he got away all night. He had an all-night meeting with Father God. Just speaking to him, fellowshipping with God. But here's the good. When he gets done with this meeting, he's ready to go again. And what does he do? He calls his followers, his disciples. Think of it. He, it, it. This is so early. He hasn't even determined who the 12 disciples are. It's right after this that he then chooses 12 to become disciples, even closer followers of his life. Why? Because evidently he's been assured of what his mission is. He's been assured all night long why God has sent him to this earth, what, what the plan was for Jesus' life. And because, because he's human, he's been assured, he's willing to assure us. And I'm going to give you two ways that Jesus is willing to assure us. Number one, he offers us assurance in the presence. Luke 12, pick it up in verse 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food and the body more than clothes, but seek his kingdom. This is picking up in verse 31, but seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, he says, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. What is this? God, God, Jesus, is giving us assurance for, for the present age. He says, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't, don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't, don't worry about your life. Just seek the kingdom, and I'll take care of everything else for you. I'll provide everything you need. I'll clothe you with everything you need. I'll provide you the protection that is necessary of life. Don't worry or fear about anybody else. Simply just trust in me, and I'll provide the assurance that you need. I'm so thankful that I have a God that's willing to assure me right here, right now. And secondly, he offers us assurance for the future. Luke 21, picking up in verse 26, it reads, Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken at that time. They will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, he says, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Hear me, if God can save me today, he can save me tomorrow. If God can save me this week, he can save me next week. If he can save me this month, he can save me next month. If he can save me this year, he can save me next year. And matter of fact, Scripture reveals he can save me all throughout eternity. I've just got to be willing to put my life in his hands to say, God, I, I'm surrendering to you. God, I'm, I'm trusting in you. God, I'm, I'm resting in your assurance today, but I'm resting in your assurance tomorrow. I'm resting in your assurance next week. I'm resting in your assurance next month. I'm resting in your assurance next year. And matter of fact, God, I'm resting in your assurance all throughout eternity. Why? Because God is able to do that. Luke says, we have a God who cares, the humanity of God, Jesus, a God who cares and understands. As a human who is maybe facing temptations of life, struggling with forgiveness, maybe just in need of assurance, I love, I love what Peter says through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Peter 5, verse 7. Cast all your cares, cast all your anxieties upon him. 
because he cares for you. You see, we're not designed to hold them in, to deal with it ourselves. What we are designed to do is to trust in a God who cares. I think a big mistake people make today is casting all their anxiety and cares on a bunch of people who don't really care about them. They may act like you care because you give them a $30 copay, a $50 copay, a $100 copay. They'll prescribe you a few different things. Why not just turn into the one who's not going to charge you a dime and will take care of all your problems? Do we believe that God cares? I would say because he was human, he demonstrated to us, cares about us. He walked through life just like you and I are walking through life today. And what does he say? Cast all your cares upon me. Because I care for you. And I believe, I believe he'll heal your life. He'll restore your life. He'll refresh your life. Because he truly cares about each one of us. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning, church?